Absolutely. Well, if you have your Bibles with me and you want to open up to God's Word, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 19 today. And how many of you got your analog Bibles with you? Let me see your, your, your paperback Bibles, man. That's so awesome. How many of you got your digital Bibles with you? Absolutely. Well, make sure you get those out in Matthew chapter 19. Get your message notes out, all that good stuff. And while you are doing that, I do want to make sure and say, please help me celebrate everybody. Happy Mother's Day. Can you put your hands together and celebrate everybody in here today? Man, yeah, it is, it is an honor to celebrate with you. And I hope for so many of you, you were with us as we celebrated Mother's Day yesterday at our Mother's Day tea. Uh, I have heard so many wonderful things already about how wonderful it was, and we do love you so very much. And that is just an honor uh, to be able to celebrate you all in that way. And thank you for everybody who put that together and just, just wanted to say we love you so very much. Yeah, we can, put up, we can celebrate all those people too. There was a lot of people that worked really hard for that. And so uh, just, it was an honor to be able to celebrate that uh, yesterday to really take time and honor our mothers. And I do want to say to you that today's the day if you forgot until this morning, do not let us know who you are. But if you forgot that it was Mother's Day until you got here, don't worry, we got you covered. Okay, out at the Welcome Center, we have got some Mother's Day cards. They are blank on the inside and not, I suggest, on the left-hand side, you just write, I'm sorry, 100 times for forgetting it was Mother's Day, all right? So, so we've got you covered. And so make sure that you get one of those. If you don't have one, I see some already using them. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Here's the thing though. It, we are not gonna be the one to get it to your mother. So I don't exactly know how that's gonna work out, all right? You go see her or you put it on a pigeon. I don't know what you're gonna do, but you figure that one out by yourself, all right? But happy Mother's Day to everybody. And I hope that you have an absolutely wonderful day, okay? Well, if you're just now joining us, what we are doing is we're in the middle of a long series through the Gospel of Matthew. And we're just walking with Jesus over the course of his life. And, and the idea behind this is, is we called it King Jesus, because that's the idea of the Gospel of Matthew. And in order to not lose the theme of what we're doing, we split it up into different seasons, like a Netflix series. And so what we did was, is we put it into different seasons, and we're almost finished with the series. But in season one, we called it the origin story at the beginning. And over the first four chapters of Matthew, the big idea was is that Jesus is the rightful king and he came in power to rescue all of us. And at the end of season one, it was just a party with Jesus. He was, he was healing people, he was collecting disciples. And then as we went over into season two, the Bible says that Jesus paused. He went over on the side of a hill and he started teaching the people. And what he started teaching the people is this idea that the foundation of the kingdom of God is a slow growing joy that starts from the bottom and it slowly works its way up. And we called it the message, but we could have called it soul therapy. And it was just, you know, talking about that big idea that everybody you know has a private battle that only they know about. Look at your neighbor and say, even on Mother's Day, he's talking about you. <laughs> Takes a second, that was a lot of words to say. I got you, all right. But, but here's the thing, we all got them. And here's it, Jesus knows. And he wants to help us grow and develop into our relationship with him. But then we learned in season three, because Jesus said, who's going to help me share this gospel? And many times as we're walking with God, we can feel like that we're not qualified. We're not the one that's going to share the gospel with others. But he taught us over the course of season three that as we follow him, he empowers all of us to make a difference. And that's the big idea of season three. And that is that God doesn't wait until we're finished, but as he is growing us and as he is healing us and developing us, he empowers us to make a difference in our world. And that was what season three was all about. And then when we got to last season, as we could see that it's getting a lot more you know, complex where Jesus is and that there's, he's got enemies over here and he's got disciples over here, but yet he continues to teach all of us this big idea that if we could just see the world the way he does it. And we talked about it like this, that the, that, that the kingdom of heaven is a spiritual reality that changes how we see everything else. And the whole season was about that when we begin to see the world the way Jesus sees the world, we would go from seeing you know, the world as, as one problem after another to one possible adventure after another. Because when Jesus is with you, all things are possible. And he's moving in us and he's growing us constantly. But now as we are getting close to the end of the earthly ministry of Jesus and we've switched over into season five, you know, quickly Jesus' earthly ministry is coming to an end. He's literally heading to Jerusalem and all the bad things and all the good things are about to happen. 
But as this is starting to, to unfold, Jesus is now trying to set up his kingdom in a way that is going to long outlast his lifetime ministry, even to the point that now we are still the kingdom of God because of the fact that he set up the kingdom the way he did. And, and one of the, the big ideas that he set up, and that's the, the goal of season five, is that the kingdom of heaven is at its best when its community fights for unity. So if you're taking analog notes, I want you to circle that word best. And then it's the kingdom is at its best when it fights for unity. And we have to constantly do this because we all know this, that we don't drift toward unity. We drift toward disunity. We drift toward isolation. We drift toward, toward all the different things and the conspiracy theories and all that kind of stuff. And so we have to fight to remain together in community. And it's a fight that we all have to do together. And there's, there's so many different, you know, uh, mental images that go through my mind when I think about, you know, the kingdom of heaven and fighting for unity. And we've talked about some different ones and we've got a lot more. But one of them that comes to my mind is the idea of driving. Now, nobody's ever done this, just me, because I'm, I'm gonna kind of do this to myself. But when I was uh, younger, and I'm gonna act like this didn't happen recently. I'm gonna act like this happened when I was like 19, 20, okay? But when I was much younger, I had a car and I was still learning how to drive, okay? And so as I was learning how to drive, it seemed like I found every pothole in the road. Like, if you needed to know where they were, ride with me, and I would help you discover the potholes. I could also tell you where all the curbs were, because I hit every one of those, all right? I hit, if you could hit it with your tires, I hit it. And I'm, I'm talking about a long time ago, not literally yesterday. But the idea was, is that I would hit all of these potholes and all of these curbs and all the things you weren't supposed to hit until my car was so bad out of alignment that just, just letting go of my steering wheel, it would actively head to the left. It didn't veer to the left. It was like headed straight for oncoming traffic and eventually into the ditch. And so what I had to do is just to keep my car in the center of the road, and let's act like I drove like this, okay? Let's, let's act like I did that instead of like this or like that, you know, whatever. But I, I would have to literally hold my steering wheel like this and actively turn it that way just so it would stay in the middle of the road. And so I would actively have to fight to keep my car out of the ditch. And eventually I found out that this thing called mechanics are possible. And you have friends who can help you fix your car. But then you hit stuff again and you start swerving. Just me. I know, just me. But I would constantly have to fight to keep my car in the road. And when I think about the kingdom of God, that is exactly what I think about. Because we are on, Jesus called it the narrow road that leads to life. But if we're not careful, we constantly on this narrow road hit potholes, hit things that we didn't expect hit unexpected obstacles. And if we're not careful, it always wants to make us veer on toward danger or veer off into these different ditches of life. And so what we constantly have to do is we have to constantly course correct to make sure that we are on purpose staying in the middle of the road. And that's why that the kingdom of heaven is at its best when we together fight for unity and we fight to keep ourselves in the road. And that's what we're going to talk about today is that God's got a big idea for us. But many times because of things that happen in our life, we have to course correct and make sure we're staying in the middle of the road. So let's read what God's word has to say. And two weeks ago, he was talking about what to do when somebody you know gets into a bad situation. And then last week, he talked about forgiveness. And then today, he's going to carry on to the next thing. And that is that God's word says that when Jesus finished talking about all these different things, he left Galilee and went down to the region of Judea east of the Jordan River. So he's literally headed to Jerusalem. And large crowds followed him there, and he healed their sick. Some Pharisees came and tried to trap him. So these are bad actors with bad things to say. And they asked him this question, should a man be allowed to divorce his wife for just any reason? And Jesus just kind of, you know, verbally slapped him in the face, was like, haven't you ever read the scriptures? By the way, these are people who memorized large portions of the Torah. So he's kind of being a little sarcastic. Haven't you read the scriptures? They record that from the beginning, God made them male and female. And he said, this explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife. And they are two, are united into one. Since they are no longer two, but one, let no one split apart what God has joined together. Well, then why did Moses say in the law that a man could give his wife a written notice of divorce and send her away, they asked. But then Jesus replied, Moses permitted divorce only as a concession to your hard hearts, but it was not what God had originally intended. 
And I tell you this, whoever divorces his wife and marries someone else commits adultery unless his wife has been unfaithful. But then Jesus' disciples said to him, wait a minute now, if this is the case, it is better not to marry. Not everyone can accept this statement, what they just said, but only those to whom God helps. Some are born as eunuchs, Lord help us. Some have been made eunuchs by others, Lord really help us. And some choose not to marry for the sake of the kingdom of heaven, praise the Lord. Let everyone accept this who can. Wow, if I didn't say it already, happy Mother's Day. <laughs> I know, right? Um, praise the Lord. To which some people might would say, one thing you don't ever wanna do on Mother's Day is talk about today's passage, okay? Because that was a lot. I don't know, there's at least one word in that passage that, that, that probably triggered everybody. I mean, you got, you got arguments, you've got eunuchs. Some of us don't even know what that is. Don't look it up right now. Ask somebody from your life group. Don't look at it on Google either. Just look it up, it's fine. And then, then there's the one word that, that everybody can understand and that is the word divorce. Like there's not a single person in this room that's not in some way been affected by divorce. My parents, my wife's parents, we're, we, we are products of a broken home, divorce. And so we're gonna get real and we're gonna talk about it because even though that is a loaded, complex you know, situation that's talking about, I see something beautiful when I read that. I see that Jesus is showing us the highest ideal of what he's looking at when he sees relationships. And so we're gonna take this, that some might consider to be complex and hard and difficult, and we're gonna talk about the beauty that is here. And that's the big idea of today is that the church fights to restore the beauty of God's design for relationships. That we're gonna talk about how we, we're gonna constantly course correct, and even in what some would consider to be hot topics, hard things, hard passages, we're gonna course correct our way back into the road to realize that man, sometimes we can miss the beauty of what God is trying to do. And that the King who created all of us also has something to say for the most difficult parts of our life. And I will go ahead and say this, that on the bottom of your message notes, you're taking analog notes. I've got a QR code there because this is a very complex topic and there's absolutely no way I'm gonna be able to do justice to every single thing that's going on. And so what I do actually on Mondays is I send out uh, a free email newsletter of some of my notes that if you wanna know where I got some of my sources from and you wanna kind of ask some questions, you can scan that and I'll send it to you every Monday morning because so I'm not gonna be able to cover everything. But what I do think is, is that there are three beautiful ideas that God gives us a window into the heart of God for relationships. And that's what I wanna do today is I wanna share with you what I think is something beautiful that Jesus is trying to do. They're trying to bait him into getting controversial and trying to bait him into something, but rather I think that he's showing us something absolutely amazing. And I want us to look at this and, and, and course correct where we need to, to realize that God's got a good idea for the most important relationships in our life. And so if you're taking notes, here's the three things that I see in this text. And that is number one, that we fight to restore the beauty of knowing Jesus sees us all. The beauty that Jesus sees us all. Look at your neighbor and say, that's just beautiful. How, how many of us need to course correct on that? Because if we're not careful, we don't think that Jesus sees us. We wouldn't say it like that, but we wonder, Jesus, do you really see us? Do you really see what's going on? It looks like this. The Bible says that Jesus had finished saying these things and he left Galilee and he went down to the region Judea, east of the Jordan River. He's literally on his way to Jerusalem. He's got a lot on his mind. There's a lot that's going on. He's got enemies over here. He's got his followers over here. But then large crowds of people are following him. And look what happens. He stops and he heals their sick. He spends time with everybody that wants to spend time with him. Can you imagine how busy he could have been? What all is going on? But the Bible didn't say that he was in a hurry. The Bible didn't say, hey guys, listen, I wish I had time for you, but I got I to debate with the Pharisees and I really need to spend time with, with my, my, uh, my 12 disciples here because I'm about to go to Jerusalem and trust me, it's gonna get interesting. And instead of that, he's like, who wants to spend time with Jesus? He sees all of them. Jesus has time for you. He's not like sometimes we think that he's forgotten us in the shuffle or, or maybe he's not paying attention. You ever done this before? I, I hope you, you haven't, but you ever been in a conversation with somebody? This happened to me just a couple of weeks ago. I was talking to somebody and we're having a conversation. I thought we were having a good conversation. And right in the middle of the conversation, you know, they, they take their phone out. And this one thing, if you have your phone under the table and you go, excuse me just for a moment, Nate, whatever, this person got their phone up and put it up this high. <laughs> 
to where I don't see their face anymore. And they look and they smile and they text back and then they look again and they smile. And I was like, hello, <laughs> I'll wait, I don't know. And it was, it was when I was in the middle of a sentence and I was like, I am so sorry that I am that boring. I will wait, you know, and if you ever felt like that sometimes when it comes to God, it's like, God, I'm trying to tell you something important. I got something on my mind, but you don't seem like you're paying attention. Can I tell you, that's not Jesus, that he sees you. I don't know what maybe is going on in your life, but if you believe anything other than Jesus sees you, it's time to course correct. Maybe you've had a, a pothole happen in your life. Maybe you've ran up against something or something has happened in your life. And because of that, now you always want to veer into God's got time for everybody else. God sees what everybody else is going through and God knows everything else has happened. Can I tell you, he sees you. He cares about you and what's going on in your life. It reminds me of today, yeah, we finally got out of the book of 1 Chronicles. Everybody say amen. Don't say it too loud because we're getting 2 Chronicles here by the end of the next week. It's fine. It's going to be just fine. But if you want to read the Bible with us, you can text RLC Bible to 94,000. And we're in 1 Thessalonians right now. And it's absolutely amazing. And one of the things I love about 1 Thessalonians is many scholars believe it was one of the first letters written after the resurrection of Jesus. At this point, it might have been really, really early on. And it was this small church in a city called Thessalonica, okay? It makes you glad you're from Bowling Green because you could pronounce that one, right? But they were there and what would happen, what had happened was is there were these false teachers that came through the city and they were telling them that God had forgotten them. God had already passed them by. He'd already come again and they just missed it. And so they were worried, did we miss? Like, did God look past us? Did, did, did we miss getting to see the Lord? And so what I love about this is, inspired of the Holy Spirit, the Apostle Paul writes this beautiful letter, and he's like, no, 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 God hasn't forgotten about you. There's still great things to come. God sees you. And I love, at the end of the, at the, end of the book, he says this, he says, may the God of peace make you holy in every way, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless until the Lord, until the day, until the Lord Jesus Christ comes again. And God will make this happen, for he who calls you is faithful. In other words, he's saying, God has got his eye on you. And he doesn't just kind of spin you into action and go somewhere else, but he starts working on you and then he focuses on you. He said, he's gonna start making you holy. He's gonna start moving in your life. He's gonna start healing you. And he's gonna stay there and watch over you until you're complete. And then he is gonna continue to do that even when we're not faithful. Even when we make mistakes, even when we veer off into the ditch, he's not gonna leave us. And so where do you need to course correct in your life? Because we have to fight for unity. And sometimes we're fighting to keep our, our perspective right and to realize that we need to restore the beauty of God's design for relationship. And the number one relationship that we sometimes need to course correct and restore is the relationship between us and him. To realize that you've never been more loved than you are right now. And that he sees you no matter what you've been through. Whatever course correction you need to make, never let anybody tell you otherwise. The second thing, which is I know what everybody's waiting for me to talk about, is the idea that Jesus says marriage is God's good design. That's, that's the second thing he was talking about because for many of us, that's going to be one of the most important relationships in our life and also the one that can wound us the deepest. And so he wants to spend time and talk about this because he intended it to be beautiful. Look at somebody and say, it really is beautiful. It really is. But you first have to start with the fact that he sees you. And he sees me and he sees everyone. And then he says, once you see me, I got something else to tell you. Watch what happens. The Bible says that some Pharisees came and tried to trap him with this question. Should a man be allowed to divorce his wife for just any reason? Now remember, these are not his friends. Okay, it literally says they came to trap him. Here's, here's what possibly is going on. Possibly the situation that's happening here is that, you know, John the Baptist got beheaded for his opinion about this. That it said that he was criticizing King Herod because he had divorced and all this kind of stuff. And he, he kind of um, gets in a hair's face a little bit. And because of that, he ends up getting arrested. Later, he gets beheaded. And so it's possible they're wanting Jesus to have a hard and fast comment about this so he can get arrested. And so they're, they're not really interested in his opinion but watch what Jesus says. Jesus completely just offends them and completely flips the script on them because he says, wait a minute, haven't you actually read the scriptures? To which they had, but they'd missed the whole point. They record that from the very beginning, God made them male and female. And this explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife and the two are united into one. They are no longer two, but one. 
Let no one uh, split. Wait a minute. Let no one split longer two but one. You know what it's supposed to say. All right, all right. That was, that's called an error right there. Let no one split apart what God has joined together. There it is. Moses permitted divorce only as a concession to your hard hearts, but it was not what God originally intended. So what was going on here is he quickly flips the entire script on them because they're wanting to talk about the ditch and Jesus is wanting to talk about the road. They're wanting to talk about the worst case scenario and he's wanting to talk about the beauty of the thing that he made. He's saying, well, listen, why, why are we automatically, of course, Moses gave concession for when the worst thing happens. That's what the law is. The law is what happens when things go wrong. The hope is that things go right. So let's talk about what's right, not just talk about what's wrong. Because in the, the world of the Pharisees, there was two, for lack of a better way of putting it, two denominations within the Pharisees. And they had this sharp disagreement over Deuteronomy chapter 24 because it said that if, if something is found indecent, then you were allowed to divorce. And they would always argue back and forth over what was indecent. And so what they had was, is two groups disagreed over the terms of divorce. You had this one group called Shemaiah, and they said only for marital unfaithfulness. So only for something absolutely huge should you do this. Then you had the Hillel group that was for any reason. And when I say any reason, I mean any reason. Like, like when you look at the things that they actually taught all the way back in the first century, like literally any reason you can imagine. So this group was like, no, 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 this is a, this is a sacred, holy thing. It should really be for the highest things you could think of. And this, these were like, nah, whatever. Like literally two of them that was considered you could get divorced for. Number one was burning dinner. Can I tell you, if that was still in effect, we wouldn't have made it past the first time I tried to boil water, okay? I can't cook anything. But that was the second one. This is no lie. The second one was for bushy eyebrows. That lady's in trouble, okay? She is in trouble if she lives in the Old Testament times. There was one that said that if you found someone that looked better, get divorced, it's fine. And so what they're arguing back and forth with is should it be something important or should it be over bushy eyebrows? And Jesus is saying, you are so far in that ditch that you're there and there's dirt on top of you. You missed the whole point. The whole point was that I made something beautiful, not about looking for loopholes. So he's like, let me start all over again and let me teach you what this was actually supposed to be about. And remember, it starts with how he sees everyone. And then he says, let me teach you the beauty of my design for marriage, not my design for getting out of it. And he said, first of all, three ways Jesus describes marriage is number one, God made it. That's beautiful. This marriage was not our invention. Marriage was God's invention all the way back. Matter of fact, he said, God's word records that from the beginning, God made them male and female, which then means according to God's word that God's definition for marriage is marriage is the union between one man and one woman for life. Oh, Lord, help us. That's, that's God's idea. That's, that is the way it's supposed to work. Man, pastor, that sounds awful narrow. You're right, it is. That's why Jesus calls it a narrow road. That is so easy to fall off into a ditch and so we have to course correct back again. That's why my heart broke, just broke so much when I heard about the United Methodist Church that has now said that it's okay that in the sight of God, somebody who's not one man and one woman can get married because that's not God's definition. And so my heart bleeds and it's broken for them and we're praying that God will come back again. That's why in our culture, a lot of times whenever they legalize same-sex marriage, that's why so many uh, Christians were broken hearted because that's not God's definition. That God's definition was there for a reason. And that's why it's so very important. He said, I, got, I made something beautiful and I want you to see how beautiful it is. The second thing he taught us is that it is the creation of a new family. It was intended to be something absolutely beautiful. He says, this explains why a man leaves his father and his mother and is joined to his wife and they are united into one. This is hilarious, by the way, because that, that word leaves right there, like that one's okay, but this, this was written originally in Hebrew and Hebrew is a very expressive language. And so the word uh, leaves there, the mental picture is that you, you turn around and you walk away really fast. <laughs> And it doesn't mean that they abandon their family and never talk to them again, but it's like they quickly leave. And then I love the word join. The word join literally means to glue together. <laughs> Can you imagine at a wedding ceremony? <laughs> I do, I do. Someone get the Elmer's glue. <laughs> We're gonna glue you together and now you gotta walk like this the rest of your life. But that's literally what that means. It means to glue together so that from then on you are glued. That's why it hurts so bad when it doesn't work out. It's because, have you ever glued two pieces of paper together, let it dry, and then try to pull it apart again? 
See what happens is that when you do that, one, one piece of paper goes over here, one piece of paper goes over there. It's, it's impossible to unwind something that's been wound. That's why it hurts so badly. And it's the creation of a new family. And then the third one is, is that it is a covenant, not a contract. He says, since they are no longer two, but one, let no one split apart. Let no one try to tear apart what God has joined together. Now we don't use the word covenant anymore, but that's why as Christians, it's not just simply signing a piece of paper. And that's part of it to be recognized by our government, but, but it's, it's a spiritual thing. It's a holy thing. Because back in the Old Testament where this word comes from, what they would do is, and this is gross, I know, but what they would do is, is they would take an animal and they would slaughter that poor thing and cut it into pieces, spread it out. And the two people who were joining into contract, uh, covenant with one another, they would walk in between the pieces. And what they would do in symbolizing is, if I break this covenant, may what happened to this animal happen to me which means you don't break a covenant because I don't want that to happen to me. That was what a covenant was. And what Jesus was saying is you guys are so busy looking for how should I fit inside the ditch that you forget the beautiful thing that I made. And that's the goal. And when, when marriage works perfectly, it's supposed to look like that we submit to one another out of reverence for Christ, praise the Lord. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Every man say amen. Bunch of wimps, I heard. I, not a single one of you. Watch this, okay? Husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. All the ladies say amen. amen. That's how you're supposed to do that, all right? Yes. Which means when things work out the way God intended, marriage is a beautiful, difficult thing. That's exactly what it's supposed to be. But we don't live in one of those perfect worlds, do we? Things don't always work out the way they're supposed to be. But that's why you see that Jesus was so devastated that they were just throwing around this argument, just using it as a case study. Ah, what do you think? Ah, what do you think? It's like, my goodness. No, I'm not trying to figure out how to fit inside the ditch. I'm trying to stay on the road. Because what happens when that happens is the worst, and that is this, and that is a divorce according to God's word means the death of God's idea for a family. That's why Jesus takes it so seriously. And that's why we should always weep with those who weep and mourn with those who mourn, who have been through this is because it is so difficult. And biblically, there's two destroyers of marriage. One is adultery and or being abandoned. And that's why if you wanna know more about those, I think you can fit abuse in there with abandonment. And I've got that in what's coming out tomorrow. But the idea of that is, is that it is a horrible thing that happens. And here's the thing. I had this wonderful opportunity to, to um, go through some premarital counseling with a wonderful couple. And I'm not gonna say that maybe one of the reasons why I, I agreed to do the wedding is they're getting married on the beach next month. And I'm really excited for me and them to be at the beach next month so they can get married. But one of the reasons, uh, one of the things that was amazing is I was talking to them about how important it is to stay close to Jesus because a marriage is supposed to have three, three people, you, them, and Jesus, because it's hard. And what you really need is you, them, Jesus, and a biblical counselor, RLCC. So to help you make it through those early days of marriage, because marriage is hard and it's difficult. And they looked at me as if they said, dear man, we don't need that. We're not gonna ever be in trouble. We're never gonna have an argument. Anybody married longer than five minutes think that's funny? <laughs> of course, nobody gets married going, if we do it just right, maybe one day, we'll get divorced. Maybe if we play our cards just right. Of course you don't, but it happens. But you know what I love about this text? Is, it, is Jesus didn't say that if the worst thing happens, you throw somebody away. Actually, he says, if the worst thing happens, you're still part of the family. As a matter of fact, in John chapter eight, the Bible said there was a lady caught in the act of adultery. They brought her and all the Pharisees wanted to kill her. And he said, I tell you what, whoever's without sin, you cast the first stone. And then he forgave her. And he set her free and he said, go and sin no more. And if he does that to the guilty one, how much more will he do it to the one that's innocent and everybody in between? Jesus doesn't throw anybody away. And so divorce may be the end of something that was supposed to be beautiful, but not the end of God's love for you. Nothing can cause God to change his mind about you. He sees you. That's why it's so important we take time to say, yes, we live in a broken world where yes, sometimes we fall into that ditch and yes, it's difficult. It changes God's mind about you, not one bit. He still loves you. Look at your neighbor and say, he sees you. Where do you need to course correct? Do you need to course correct because maybe you've been through that before and you think that, no, that Jesus doesn't see you? That you think that maybe the worst thing happened to you and now you're damaged goods, used, 
don't ever let the enemy lie to you and say that to you. That's a lie of the enemy. That Jesus sees you and he loves you. And he loves you just the way you are, but he loves you too much to let you stay that way. And he wants to heal you from the inside out, from everything that this world can do to you. I want to tell you, Jesus sees you. And that's his idea for relationship. And we have to fight for it. We have to fight to keep that. We have to fight to say that he sees you, that he's got a good idea for marriage. And here's the third one, and that is this. This is my favorite, that we restore the beauty that Jesus reveals there are no second-class citizens. That in the kingdom of God, Jesus reveals there are no second-class citizens. One more time, look at your neighbor and say, now that's just beautiful. It's absolutely wonderful when you think about it. He said it like this. He said, or actually first they said, if this is the case, it's better to not marry. In other words, the disciples are looking and most likely most of his disciples aren't married yet. They're like teenagers, by the way, if you didn't notice. They're, they're like teenagers. And so most of them, we know Peter's married, but the other ones are probably not married yet. They're like, wait a minute now. If it's that important and it's that beautiful, maybe I should just take the consolation prize. Maybe I should just settle to not be married. Almost as if there was something wrong with being single. And so what I love is that Jesus was like, whoa, now, hold up. We were saying Alabama, hold up now, housefly. <laughs> I got no idea what that means, but we say it all the time. He says it like this. He said, now, wait a minute. Not everyone can accept what you just said. Only those who God helps. Some are born eunuchs. Some have been made eunuchs and some choose not to marry for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Let anyone accept this who can. In other words, he's saying, who told you that not being married somehow made you second class? That actually there's something even better going on. And actually what he's saying is there's a thousand reasons why someone may be single and all of them can be beautiful. That the highest goal of Christian life is not to be married, it's to know God. And can I tell you the honest truth is I need to just, as, as your pastor, I need to just repent before all of you right now that as the big C church, we make so much room for married couples, and we should, but we don't make near enough room for people who are unmarried. We don't make near enough room for single people that they can thrive in what God has called them to do. You know, we've created one too many singles, you know, life groups that's really just like, like Christian, you know, dating circles is really all it is. It's like, you know, Jesus loves you, and once you get married, he's gonna love you a lot. No, 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 no. There are no second-class citizens in the kingdom of heaven, and I have no idea why that happened but there's nothing wrong with you. If you're single right now, Jesus loves you exactly the way you are. You got nothing to prove. You have nobody to impress. Jesus loves you just the way you are in that singleness. And that's what Jesus is saying is because a lot of times eunuchs in that culture were considered to be toward the bottom of the social totem pole. And Jesus is saying is, I know you may see them as less than, but I don't. I see them just as important as any of you. And so the important thing to realize is, is to realize that you have the gift that you're married and we need to see it as a gift, but then also they have a gift. Matter of fact, Paul said it like this. He says, I wish everyone were single just as I am. Yet each person has a special gift from God of one kind or another. In other words, singleness is a gift. And Jesus is saying, no matter where you are, no matter what you're experiencing, I see you. I see you. If you're in the crowd and you feel like you've been forgotten, I see you if you're in a married situation. I see you if you've experienced the horrors of divorce. I see you if you haven't and you just don't fit. Can I tell you one of the reasons why we stopped doing marriage series around here is because of the fact that a growing number of people in our church are not there and they've experienced the horrors of divorce. And now they feel like that God somehow has a second-class citizen situation for them. And that's not true. You're just as important to the kingdom of God as anybody else. And so where do you need to course correct today? Are you in a situation where maybe if you're not careful, you've, you've kind of hit kind of some potholes in life? You hit some curbs in life? You know, you, you kind of, some, something we've said today, and it kind of, you, you realize maybe you're not where you, you want to be, and you got to fight back for that. Maybe you feel like you're just someone in the crowd and that Jesus doesn't really pay attention to you because of something that's going on in your life. Or maybe you're in a, a married situation and there's something going on there. Maybe you're in a divorce situation and there's been that death of that ideal that God had for you. Or maybe you feel like a second class citizen. If that's you, wherever you find yourself today, this is my hope for you. And this is God's word for you today. And that is 
Romans 8 verse 1, that there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. What makes you holy is not your status in life. What makes you holy is Jesus. He's the one that matters. He's the one that makes you holy. And the honest truth of it is, is that Jesus sees you, whether you are single, married, single wanting to be married, married wanting to be single, just look at me, just look at me, divorced, widowed, or just plain confused. Can I tell you? Jesus sees you, but we gotta fight for that. Because we live in a culture that if we're not careful, makes us wanna go off, off into the ditch. Or the potholes of life, the difficulties of life. Some of the biggest potholes of life is when you get married and you say, this is forever. But your spouse had a different idea. You decide to give your heart to somebody and they never gave their heart to you. Or if you thought this point in life, I would be married and you're not. Or if you are happily single and everybody's trying to fix you up with somebody, can I tell you, Jesus sees you. And for all of our mothers out there, if you're, if you're balling on a budget and you are single mom in it right now, can I tell you, Jesus sees you. If you're an empty nester, Jesus sees you. If you want to be a mom, but it hasn't yet worked out, can I tell you that Jesus sees you? Maybe you have been through the worst thing anybody can imagine. And that's why Mother's Day is so complicated. Can I tell you that Jesus sees you? And God's word for you is, I'm convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither fears for today or worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Can I tell you, however you find yourself today, God sees you. But where do you need to course correct in your life? Do you feel like he doesn't see you? Do you feel like because of things in your life, you're just one of the crowd and Jesus kind of glances at you from time to time, but no, God's word says that he watches over you. He watches over you in the sunshine and sometimes he carries us in the rain. That when all these, these things happen in life and that the potholes of life happen, he says, I got a beautiful idea for you called marriage. And when it works the way I intended it to be, it's wonderful, but then when it doesn't, I don't throw you away. I still love you. And I got a plan for you. And then sometimes we go through things in life, we feel like that second class citizen. We feel like that everybody else is kind of getting ahead and we're kind of there at the bottom. Can I tell you, that's not Jesus. That's culture. That's, that's the lie of the enemy. That Jesus loves you more than you can imagine. You've never been more loved than you are right now. That's the hope of the gospel. That the Bible says that for God so loved the world, that he gave his one and only son that whoever would believe in him, he didn't say the fortunate few, but for everyone that would believe in him, they would not perish but have eternal life. Jesus loves you, no matter what state you find yourself in today. In just a moment, the band's gonna give us an opportunity to pray and I just wanna ask you this question, where do you need to course correct in your life? Maybe you would be in here and you would say, you know, I'm not, I'm not on that narrow road. I'm not on that road. I don't know Jesus, but I want to. I wanna know the King who sees me. Can I tell you, you've never been more loved than you are right now. You've tried everything else. It's time to give your heart to Jesus. It's time to come on home to Him. Inside your worship guide on the back of your connect card is a prayer that you can pray. And it's not just about words on a page, it's about a position of your heart where you give Him everything. You give Him your failures, you give Him your sin, give him your successes, you give him everything, and you say, Jesus, I give you everything. That's what salvation is. And if you'll take that step, he is longing for you. He's not ashamed 
of you. He's in love with you. And if he had to do it all over again just for you, he would willingly go to the cross again. That's how loved you are. Maybe you're in here and you've experienced the sting of loneliness, the sting of divorce, the sting of being in a marriage, but not everybody in that marriage agrees how we're supposed to do it. The sting of wanting to be single, but yet feeling the pressure of others. I don't, I don't know what the enemy has put in your path to try to get you off of that joy that the Lord has for you. But maybe in this moment, you just say, God, I give my life over to you again. I choose to step toward healing. I choose to step toward forgiveness. And for those of you today, that today's a hard day because your mom's not with you. Can I tell you, Jesus sees you. He sees you right where you are. That's the thing I, I love about the Lord is that he, as many people that are in the room, there's as many things he's able to do. He only reveals what he intends to heal. But we have to take a step. That was the thing about the crowd. The Bible said the crowds came to Jesus. And as many that came to him, he had time for. Where do you need to come to Jesus in your life so you can experience his healing today? Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for today. Thank you, God, for your healing and your mercy and your kindness. I'm thankful, Lord, for your word that speaks truth into our life. And your truth, God, is that you see us right where we are. You see us in every phase of our lives. God, you have a great design for us. And the first and foremost design is that you want us to know that you see us. I pray for everybody under the sound of my voice, Lord, that they feel that tugging of you, Holy Spirit, as you're speaking to them, as you're drawing them. I pray they will realize that that's you, Holy Spirit, still seeking after them. And as they draw close to you, your word says, you draw close to us. And as we worship you in a moment, I pray, God, that as they pray that prayer, as they give their life and their heart to you, that like a flood, you will rush into their heart and their soul. And they will know that today's the day they were born again. God, I pray for everyone else under the sound of my voice. As many people that are in here are the many different ways that you speak to us. Some, God, it's time for us to course correct some things that we have believed that's not in your word. And we may not even like it, we may not even agree with it, but instead we say we trust you and we choose to follow you. Others, God, who've experienced the pain of the different deep relationship things, I pray you will help us to remember that you see us. And as we worship you today, we ask you, God, to be the difference maker in our hearts and in our life. Have your way in this time together. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And would you stand with me all over the house this morning? The band is gonna lead us in one more song of worship. I don't know exactly how the Holy Spirit may be speaking to you. Maybe right where you are, you wanna just lift your hands to the Lord and just allow him to speak into your life right now. Maybe you wanna go back to one of our prayer team. We'd love to pray with you about whatever's going on in your life. I just wanna give you a moment just to spend time in the presence of God. Let him heal whatever it is he's bringing up in your heart and your soul right now.